uh, emergency topics related to the water leak and the fix and the salvage and the cleanup or whatever has to be related. You can't discuss, uh, you know, bringing Lindsay in to open meetings. You know what I mean? You can't go afield. It can't be a shill for further afield topics. Um, but uh, that's pretty, except for the closed session part, that's pretty much the end of the legal rules for this meeting and business sense kicks in in the sense that uh, do you have uh, a time to get only one estimate of a, of a I, I can't, server pro is a cleanup group you know for these uh, do, you, do you go out and call three people and how soon can they get here or do you, do you stop at server pro the first five minutes and you bring them in uh, and they're saying you know for five thousand because that's expensive by the way I've been through this a couple of times five thousand dollars we can get in here today and start vacuuming up uh, and, and, and save some of your, your books and treasures and l limit the damage. You won't eliminate it, but limit the damage. So you may not go at all into bidding. You know, it's, it, it's emergency, but I'm, I would just simply say you use business judgment. You know, at what point do you, do you say, we've got enough with Server Pro's estimate to go forward? I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. I, I think I get what you're saying. Now let's put a, a cause to that problem. Let's say an employee on Monday failed to shut something off that it was their responsibility to do. Mm -hmm. It caused a minor problem. Mm -hmm. It was found Tuesday morning. Tuesday, they did it again. Mm -hmm. it caused a minor problem, but it was Wednesday causes the flood. Now the board has said we cannot have that employee. Now it becomes a personnel issue. Can they go into closed session to prevent that from happening again on Friday? Well, yeah, but um, let me, I mean, that's, I was thinking, if, let, let me come to my example of closed session purpose, and then I'll come back to yours, because mine's a little easier. <laughs> um, uh, it, I have had uh, emergencies, tornado damage being the, the one that's coming to my mind, where the, uh, the emergency meeting uh, went into closed session to discuss the lease of replacement property and the reason it was emergency or, 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 or need uh, right then was that they were going to relocate whatever they could salvage from the site into this leased premises. And they had enough information from this available uh, building you know, to lease. But they did go into closed session to discuss you know, the, 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 the uh, building, what it offered, what its cost would be. Uh, actually, the biggest point was how long they would have to commit to be able to use it that day and, and whether they, they really felt like they had to commit to a minimum of 90 days, which is what the landlord you know, was requiring. So, so they had that discussion in closed session and then they came back you know, to, to deal with other emergency issues of the, of the tornado. But that took place in the emergency meeting? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they, went into, they went into closed so session. My, 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 my problem, and this may be more than you wanted to raise by your example, uh, but, it, but frankly, this is, a, this is a common question, too, is, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to step on any of your toes here, but under the Local Library Act, and this may come as a shock to you, but under the Local Library Act, the board uh, retains a director, and the director is really in charge of personnel hiring, firing, and discipline. And then there's the key phrase, subject to the approval of the board. Okay, and I admit that. And so what that does is that invites, in my experience, that invites a continuum. I have approvals of the board that I label rubber stamps. I mean, the majority of the board just rubber stamps anything D says and personnel happens. I, that may never happen here, but that's one end of the extreme. The other extreme is what I label personally on micromanagers. You don't even hire anybody without a board sitting in on the interview. I don't like either extreme for the obvious reasons. I prefer informed approval by the board, uh, and I, th I encourage directors to keep their boards informed on both personnel challenges and personnel decisions. But so, so sort of the personnel part of your question was leading me to say, I'd want that. I want my director to 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 be stepping in on that employee now, whether I'm suspending, terminating may depend on a lot of the various facts, and I'm a lawyer, not the manager, but 
So I, I don't know. Yes, I would want my board informed about that, and at some point they have to approve that. But uh, but whether I need a personnel closed session meeting, well, you know what I mean. That that's can you have an emergency meeting and then go into a closed yes, session? Yes, yeah, and you can. And I just use that as yeah. an example. Yeah. Well, it's a good example because personnel is one of the listed reasons. Or I mean, again, two C one. It's not the word personnel, but. Um, in no particular order, uh, the Open Meetings Act now at least has criminal penalties possible. They, we, in Illinois, we have no history of crim criminal penalties for Open Meetings Act violations. I only know of one prosecution. It was in, uh, I always get these confused. I think it was Danville. Uh, many years ago, city council uh, alleged to have violated the Open Meetings Act when they were settling the voting rights case. But the real problem was their settlement, they were commissioned form of government. I don't know if you know much about municipalities, but just suffice to say that the settlement of the voting rights litigation preserved um, those are unlike yours by the way those are highly paid positions I mean commissioners on city councils get paid you know 75,000 100,000 I mean serious money because those are jobs and and no you DeKalb is not no no reference to the our current uh, city uh, friends but uh, my, my only point was in Danville, what they had done with this closed session settlement was basically line their own pockets. I mean, that's what the state's attorney would have said, and, and, and factually true. Now, they didn't actually go all the way through the prosecution, and there wasn't a criminal penalty, but there was a filing, and it was subsequently dropped. That's the only prosecution I've ever known of. The, the, the point is, for most people, is uh, uh, compliance, not penalty. The... Uh, uh, it's especially true because I have yet, I know you probably also have yet to find any way that you're uh, uh, rewarded for your community service on the library board, certainly not financially, but anyway, uh, I want you to at least know that that's there. Um, the uh, brings me to, in, in capital letters here, no final action in closed session. I've alluded to that earlier. The Open Meetings Act does say uh, no final action in close in close session, or really, really, what it says is all final action must be taken in open session. But they don't define the term final action, and honestly, this has been a troublesome factor. I don't know if some amendment someday will define final action. I doubt it, because it's frankly very hard to define, because it's contextual in my experience. What's final action? And I alluded to earlier. You know, when I'm asked to negotiate something. That is not final action because I know I will not accomplish it. I mean, I, I, I may accomplish a proposal, but I can't, you know, as a delegate, as an attorney, as an agent, uh, uh, buy property, let's say, as an example. We may colloquially say that I'm buying property, but I'm not. It's going to be somebody else's approval of the buy-sell uh, that's closed. Uh, but there's all kinds of examples, you know, of... of uh, when something becomes final action and when is it preliminary? Uh, it could be essential step to the final action. It could be a gratuitous step, maybe not even essential, just our, by our choice and our discretion. We'd like to gather some more bids or more uh, information. Uh, I say that's discretionary because it's maybe not required by any law anywhere, but it's something we want to give us the comfort to eventually take the final action. My personal practice is um, I, every opportunity possible, I go to the outsider, I'll call it, to propose in as final form as possible uh, the action that then is brought to the library board so that we can get final action. Because if there's loose ends or undetermined things or issues to be resolved, then that is likely not final action. So whether it's uh, a buyer of property, I've got one right now as an example. We've got a guy who really wants to buy a library system parcel. As you all know, library systems are basically bankrupt now. So they want to sell their properties to the first reputable purchaser, right? But he hasn't dotted every I, crossed every T, and really figured out what he wants to pay. He's not being coy. I mean, I think it will come to that. So I've told him, look, first, under our statute, we put a notice in the paper twice, you know, to, 
even have the right to take bids. We'll, be, we'll start doing that if he's serious and likely to bid. There could be other bidders, obviously, but we, we don't want to waste pay in the newspaper until we have at least one fish hooked. But it's not final action. So the board has nothing to vote on, really, at this stage. I mean, I can inform them that it looks like Joe's going to make an offer to buy this building, and it looks like he's serious to pay a reasonable price, not 50 bucks. But there's nothing for them to vote on. I mean, they can vote that I'm a great lawyer and I'm doing good things and Joe's a nice fellow. And I mean, you can vote on lots of things, but none of that's required to advance and certainly not to conclude a sale. So what's final action and what's not is always a perennial debate topic and, and tough. But it depends on the context, actually, also. Um, even personnel is not simple. You might think terminating someone is simple, but it, 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 it frequently is not. If they're over age 45, and many of us are, uh, you've got an immediate problem known as the Older Workers Benefit Protection Act, which absolutely requires a minimum seven days, uh, if not 21 days, for the, employee, the former or to be terminated employee to meet with an attorney of their own choosing at their own cost if they wish. Uh, they can waive that, but as big black printing required by the law, hitting them between the eyes, you have the right to consult with your lawyer in seven days, you know, permitted to do it. So uh, you can't necessarily even terminate. I've been delegated a task to negotiate termination severance agreements. I've got one right now with a police chief. We're de debating how much credit he gets for unused vacation or not. I mean, so there's lots of things. It may, it's, it may seem like, hey, that's final if we're going to fire that person or terminate that person. But even that's not really clear. It's the context um, of, of what issues might be presented by that uh, fact situation. Um, let's see. Um, one amendment to that uh, 10 years ago, a long, quite a while ago now, that's worth mentioning, is that in the old days, uh, when the statute said uh, final action in open session, uh, not library boards, I never saw it in a library board, but schools used to do it frequently. They go into their closed session under personnel, they'd have their discussion, they'd come back out into open session, they'd say, I move to adopt Gladys's uh, position or motion or discussion in closed session. I second it. Passes unanimously. And everybody in the audience is saying, who the heck is Gladys? Or what was Gladys talking about? Or what's option A was another one. We, I moved to adopt option A. We just spent three hours talking about option A. Nobody else knows what option A is, but I moved to approve option A. I second option A. We vote on option A. So the sta statute was amended to say, you have to explain and this is my paraphrase, this is not the exact words, but you have to explain in public session the vote, the, the, the topic, the motion, the, uh, what's being, or the action being considered and then voted on. Now, you can do that in lots of different ways. You can do it, the movement, when they make the motion. They don't say, I move option A or I move Gladys. I moved uh, to give our uh, former chief a $5,000 bonus and then terminate him or, or, you know, I mean, you can include in your motion enough information of what the action is for the public to understand it. Or you could, you could either have a motion first or follow it later with a motion of a discussion enough, you know, uh, 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 there's no motion on the table, but you, you, you sort of summarize what's at stake or what's going to be motioned. Or uh, some people prefer you make a motion. I move that we do what we've been talking about I second it. And then before there's any vote, someone remembers my speech and they say, okay, well, here's what, for your benefit, here's what, you know, we're, we're uh, considering, here's the summary, you know, of what we're going to be voting on and describe it in that way and then the vote happens. But in some way you've got to explain, okay, the, before the action is voted. Um, next entry I have is public's right to attend. Uh, there actually, there's been some cases this uh, past 18 months on this question. Uh, when you have a, a, a noticed uh, meeting, uh, and again, it's always going to start public. I mean, it may be 30 seconds in public until you make your motion to go into closed session, or it could be three hours. But the public has a right to attend the open session portions. 
They also have a right to tape open session portions as long as they don't use Klieg lights. We don't have many Klieg lights anymore. Uh, we don't, uh, this gentleman's been great, but uh, believe it or not, uh, I'll even say is it's because it was prosecuted in Collinsville. They have a cable channel uh, person, whatever his, his background is. He actually hit uh, uh, one of my library trustees in the back of the head with a camera bigger than that uh, and was prosecuted uh, because he, he wanted to come around and take video of everybody's stuff in front of them. He, he didn't, again, really care to use reason in taping, videotaping, uh, in his case, this uh, public meeting. He wanted to get in people's faces, and I think he hit him on purpose, so did the state's attorney. So uh, it's, it's not that uh, you have carte blanche in taping. You have to be reasonable. You can't disrupt. You can't hurt. You can't harm. You can't use it that way. So it's not licensed for any of that. But it is permitted, and you can't be unduly restrictive on the other side. I had a, an attorney uh, in central Illinois who, who went crazy, honestly, in my opinion. Uh, they, they taped, uh, if you use a room like this, they taped a little square on the floor and required all uh, video cameras and taping uh, to be located in that square um, and, and not move out of that square during the entire meeting. And the court took about a minute to say, you're nuts. You know, there, there's, there's a happy medium. It's not disruptive, not hurtful, not et cetera, to let them spread out, so to speak, and get, you know, reasonable taping of your public session. So that's kind of where the law stands. Uh, but I, back to the right to attend. We, these cases this year, for some reason, uh, the city and school uh, uh, meetings have had some uh, cantankerous or uh, controversial topics. And what the courts have said, well, a couple of the cases have criticized the government body for scheduling a meeting and not relocating a meeting when the audience was in the hundreds in a meeting held or meeting space held 25. They said you have to uh, recess that. You have to either schedule it and plan it in a place where there's ample room for the attendees or uh, relocate to a room that's, you know, um, large enough for the audience that wants to attend. And uh, actually, we've even had the other shoe drop because then there's another case uh, fairly recently where uh, they complained because the meeting occurred uh, in, a, in a, a, a fine enough place, uh, the room, but they went into closed session and they made the attendees, there was no other place for the attendees to go except out into the cold. And they, attend, they, they, they waited outside, I don't know if they smoked or not, but they waited outside through a, a drizzle and uh, it was hours. I think it was after midnight before the closed session ended and they were invited back in. So they sued saying that setup was not in compliance with the requirements of the Open Meetings Act. They should have had warming hut or room for the people not to spin through uh, the cold and they should not have met past midnight. Well. The court didn't take long to throw them out of court saying, you know, I think they were unpaid school district, or school districts are unpaid, but I mean, I think the court uh, said if they're attending to the public's business, I mean, that's the reason for the meeting and that's what took their devotion so long, there was no problem with that, uh, you know, the length they weren't, you know, sleeping inside while people were outside and that they did not have to provide, you know, uh, uh, protection against inclement weather or whatever. So we, we've sort of seen both sides now. You have to be somewhat reasonable in terms of the location, but not uh, providing uh, cookies and coffee. Um, under this, uh, again, it was the FOIA law I, uh, amendment effective January 1st, 2010 that I alluded to earlier in the change with respect to the PAC. The biggest change that statute made as to the Open Meetings Act, and I, I think Dee probably already realizes this, is that uh, you must have at least one designated uh, Open Meetings Act uh, person who has successfully completed online training. Um, and you had until July 1st, 2010, the first six months to do that. And now going forward, you must do it annually and you, or within 30 days of the appointment or the designation. Now, a lot of things to be said about that. 
Uh, first, um, if you haven't visited the Attorney General site, you can certainly go there and uh, under the section link to ensuring open and honest government. Lord knows she's a great politician. Uh, and so she's labeled this ensuring open and honest government. But you click on there and you're gonna get to several things, including the Open Meetings Act. I would have told you you could go there for the Open Meetings Act or the guide to the Open Meetings Act the Attorney General wrote, and a friend of mine wrote it actually, but it's four years out of date. So all of the things I've talked about that have been changed aren't yet up to date. They keep promising that they're going, to, and I didn't bring with me, but some of you may have seen in the old days, they actually printed it, several different iterations of that. They stopped printing it about five years ago when they knew it was so out of date. And I don't know when their next plan to get it updated and out, because the act changes enough that they haven't. The last time I looked, they had not yet updated the guide, but the old guide is still on there if you want it. I think they haven't taken it down. Um, if you want their view somewhat dated. But more importantly, there's the online training. And then you, actually there's a, 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 a choice. You can do the unregistered, unlabeled uh, online training. It's about, I can't remember now, it's been six months since I did it. I'm gonna say maybe 50 slides that you click through multiple choice. Uh, if you want credit, like you're an OMA designee and you need the certificate, then you have to pick another choice and register, you know, who you are, who you're for. And it's the same exact questions uh, that you go through the online list. So if you ever wish to go through there, and they didn't do a horrible job with it. I mean, there's one or two I quarrel with their questions and their answers, uh, but I understand why they've answered in the way they have. This is a complicated, you know, web of stuff. By and large, they've done a fairly good job of trying to train. It's totally unclear, by the way, if you don't succeed. Remember I said you had to successfully complete online training? Well, nobody knows if you fail, uh, whether you don't count. Uh, you can redo it. You could probably redo it 40 times. I mean, I didn't try that test. I did try, by the way, I'll not unduly lengthen this, but I'll tell you one more story. A few years ago, you know, you have an ethics act, and I think you've adopted a model ethics policy in accordance with that act. That was the first time the, uh, not for locals, but the state employees must take an online ethics training. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Well, it's typical academia. Somebody at U of I or some group at U of I, thankfully they were in a union uh, of professors. They got the bright idea, uh, since this is required annually, a task they must do to remain a state employee that they would take the test uh, online and they would take it in about, I think the shortest was two and a half seconds. <laughs> well, they, they uh, uh, the central management services that operates this have, a, have a, a logarithm that measures how long it took you to get through the test. So obviously they knew anybody that went two and a half seconds didn't, in good faith, take the test. So they uh, sent out Letter. This goes back a couple years, but they sent out letters to all these people threatening that they weren't going to be employed uh, because they had failed to take the test faithfully. Well, of course, their union got involved and said that's an unfair labor practice, and if you don't stop this immediately, we'll sue you. And that was back when Illinois had a little bit of money, and they would have taken them for their money. So anyway, that's the backstory. My task with the Open Meetings Act and the Freedom of Information Act online was to figure out if A, the certified registered screens and questions were the same as the public open ones not registered, and they are. They were identical. Because these are kind of questions I get, you know, can we practice? Yes, you can if you want. Um, and there's also no, well, I don't believe there's any uh, logarithm or, 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 or protocol that tests how long it takes you. Because I did my Open Meetings Act in a minute and a half. That's about as fast as you can get through the 56 uh, screens. Those aren't all questions. There's only about 15 questions um, interspersed. And I'd already seen it, so I kind of knew what it was. I was simply wanting to get through as fast as humanly possible. I think I did, and they still give me a certificate. So for any of you that care about that. But even if you're not the designee, you can visit the site and, and take a look at that. It's, it's certainly, uh, or the Freedom of Information Act for that matter. Uh, it's certainly a good refresher. Somebody's required to do it each year. 
uh, or uh, if, it, if replaced within 30 days. And where's that site? It's the yeah. Illinois Attorney General's website. Um, and you know they changed their URL a few uh, months back, so I'm not sure I can tell you uh, the, the URL, but I, if you Google Lisa Madigan, you'll get there, or Attorney General, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll get to it. Um, that's, I think that's pretty much all uh, about that uh, new or newer requirement. Uh, next uh, topic that I haven't referred to at all, but um, is, is certainly worth mentioning. One of the requirements in the Open Meetings Act is that the news media, and that's not really defined, we don't think it includes bloggers or the last time the Attorney General verbally gave an unofficial opinion, they didn't think it was bloggers, but uh, it was the print, the media, uh, the electronic media, uh, being radio and TV. Uh, news media that annually, that means every year or each year, in writing, provides you a name and an address, perhaps a phone number and fax number, that registers with you, is entitled to the same notice, I'm gonna say the best notice, of your meetings, any of your meetings, that any of your board members get, okay? So for instance, let's say D sends an email to all of you that we're gonna have this meeting tonight, or I don't know how you get out the notice, maybe you mail it, maybe you phone it, you can you know, notify about this meeting in, in, in a better way than just posting it or just mailing it. But whatever that way is, including the emergency meeting, if you have anybody in the media registered, and frankly libraries don't really uh, deprive anyone uh, and argue about whether they're news media or not news media, that blogger references more cities and schools that care but libraries probably are happy enough to have anybody register, right? You just simply add, you've never had, yeah, that's, I hear that too often. But in any event, anyone who's registered that year is entitled to the same notice. A phone call, if that's what you give to the best facts, et cetera. But they are entitled to that if they annually, and by the way, they all know the requirement, or they, all the ones I know, you know, it's, it's, it's taught that if you want Open Meeting Act notices provided in the statute, you must register. So if we've never had a request, they either don't know it or they don't want it. I, 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 I stop, I, I don't use the word request, I use the word registration, but, but I stop right there. You either have it or you don't have it. And if you have it, then you notify them. If it, if it goes past the year and it's old, I, I have some libraries that have them five years ago, and, and they still send it to them, but it's not an annual register. In other words, it's not legally required. It's, it's sort of a courtesy, but it's easy enough to do. 